Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our uh, YouTube channel for experts in uh, AML compliance and uh, adjacent areas. Today we have a new guest. Uh, his name is Rajpal Kangura. He is the professional AML compliance officer and money laundering compliance officer and advisor in these areas. Um, I'm sure that Raj can uh, reintroduce himself in a more broader way. Uh, I know that you have a lot of experience and a lot of uh, places where you, you apply your experience and a lot of clients, uh, places where you worked. Probably we need some kind of an ex executive um, summary, um, if it's possible. Yeah, thank you, Tony. So I've been working in the compliance and risk area for over 10 years now, probably close to 14 years actually. I started in the online gaming space, which is obviously very high risk for, you know, the verticals of AML and CTF. Um, and over the years, I've just really, really progressed quite rapidly because it seems that money laundering is becoming more of an issue, becoming more prevalent. And I've been helping many payment institutions and crypto firms actually to put in controls, procedures, risk matrices, um, and advising them on the relevant regulations and licensing and how we can essentially combat against uh, bad actors within the money laundering and the counter-terrorist financing area. How do you think, is it more complicated to be an MLRO in the area of payments or in the area of FX or in the area of crypto? You can compare these things. You can compare them, uh, but the only way of really comparing them is via the risk, right? So in payments and in crypto, it's really, really high risk. So as an MLRO, um, the risks are the things that keep me up at night, <laughs> essentially, because all the responsibility and the accountability would be on me. Um, so, I mean, and the same goes for online gaming as well. They're all very, very high risk, but in the payments field, especially right now, uh, because of the sheer speed at which funds can cross borders, the regulations are getting tighter. And that's where also they're looking at crypto now to regulate just as a don't want to say a traditional financial institution, but as a financial institution. Um, and with the rise of stable coins coming along as well now, being an MLRO, whether you're in crypto or in payments or in gaming, the level of risk is already heightened. Right, if we're talking about FX, in most cases, the, uh, uh, the, we're talking about very, very small spreads of, uh, of, of, of monies that are going back and forth. Whereas, for example, in crypto, we can find large, large payments that can go from one entity to another. So uh, definitely the, the specificity of risk is different in this, uh, in this area, in this sense. Uh, what, uh, I, would, I would be interested, interested maybe you can, you can give to the audience um, some good examples from your experience, let's say, how you spot, uh, let's say, suspicious transactions and what are the typical suspicious transactions. If we look at the uh, crypto space to begin with, suspicious transactions, um, there's so many of them because it's more on blockchain monitoring, right? It's not your traditional fiat transactions. So blockchain monitoring has got really, really sophisticated now. You can tell if assets are coming from a weak exchange with weak money laundering and KYC controls, whether it's coming from an offshore exchange, whether a wallet has even been seen on the dark web, for example, has been involved in hacking, Ponzi schemes, um, child exploitation. And essentially what you get is these wallets with high risk scores and you don't really want to transact with those, but you need to have a risk based approach to it. So seeing a wallet just on the dark web, I mean, we know the dark web is full of illicit activity, but it's nowhere near as high risk as someone that may have done ransomware or terrorist financing. Um, and equally also being offshore, someone like the Seychelles, right? Do you really trust that that exchange has done their appropriate KYC before it comes to you? Because you want to see how the flow of funds moves essentially. Now, if you flip to the payment side, where you're looking at fiat transactions, you're looking for things like velocity controls. You know, is somebody transacting multiple times within the hour? Um, are they deviating from their, their normal transaction pattern? Are they smurfing? Are they putting in very low transactions all the time um, to elude any uh, reporting requirements from the entity because these bad actors they know what the reco reporting requirements are 
FX, very similar to the payment side, obviously, as you said, smaller spread, um, but you're looking at the activity of the client. It's very essential that you know your customer um, because knowing your customer comes right at the beginning of your business relationship. Um, and once the funds get placed into the financial system, at that point, it becomes very hard to elude whether you're in FX, whether you're in crypto, whether you're in payments, whether you're in any industry, to be honest, because the KYC part happens at the beginning and then you can do it ongoing, but then it's essential that within your transaction monitoring rule set, you're able to catch these bad actors once they're in the platform. So as Rajpal just mentioned, the ML risks and the fraud risks uh, that you may face as an ML compliance officer um, can be different from the industry to the industry, from the sector to the sector. And so if you work in FX or payments or crypto or gaming, your KYC solution should be adjusted to the specific risks that are characteristic in your um, industry. This is extremely important. If your system doesn't work this way, there can be a problem and a, a possible risk. And of course, it's not just about industries. It's, let's say, uh, there are th uh, plenty of risk factors related to regions. Um, the specific documents that your uh, users may provide to you, or let's say um, the uh, technology level, or some data regulations uh, that can uh, limit the uh, documents and information you can collect. And finally, everything should be very easy and quick for the user. If, the, if it's complicated, if your user gets caught in the middle of your verification process, it basically can uh, adversely affect your conversion. So is there a solution that may provide you uh, a balanced approach to um, compliance and risk factors um, in specific industries? Industry and of course the easiness and uh, quality of the solution in general. This is exactly some sub. We provide not just technology or um, an AI powered solution, but also we provide the expertise of our team. And in our team, we have uh, experts not only in technology, but also in AML compliance and in risk factors related to specific industries, such as FX, crypto, gaming. And of course, you can get an opportunity to talk to them and to get the solution that will be specifically tailored to your industry. With that, you will be rest assured that what you get from us, what our experts provide is uh, the best solution that is adjusted to your specific business needs and also providing a bulletproof compliance and protection against any fraud. If you want to learn more about this, um, look at the link below um, and also check out our website for general information. And otherwise, let's get back to the interview. Most people think that, I mean, I'm actually part of this people to a certain extent, that the payments area in general is basically a trading risk. Like, uh, obviously, when, you, when we're talking about payments, you have banks uh, as like, a, like the main, uh, let's say, skeleton infrastructure of uh, international financial system. And then you have payments institutions whose main, ide main idea is to facilitate payments where banks would not do it because of risk. Um, considerations, for example. And so basically these payment institutions are like helping out uh, banks in a certain extent, the financial, international financial system. But at the same time, they're kind of like trading risk because they can take more risk than, than, than banks. Is, uh, can you comment on this? Is, is that a, a, a fair perception? Yeah, I wouldn't say that payment institutions are helping banks. Banks, they are the alternative to banks. So you have um, institutions like neo banks, you have settlement banks, and you know the payments industry right now is getting fluctuated with new solutions where payment institutions, electronic money institutions, and MSBs essentially are coming to the forefront over banks because you're correct in saying that these institutions do take on a larger amount of risk but they also have, in my opinion, larger amounts of controls in place, larger amounts of frameworks in place. Um, the payments, you know, they're doing payment processing, they're providing IBANs, they're providing virtual cards, they're providing actual physical cards as well for clients. 
uh, going back to the processing part, they're doing merchant processing and that's also in crypto. So they're doing merchant crypto payment processing nowadays um, and you're doing normal payments uh, processing in fiat. The things with banks are, when you compare a bank to, let's say a payments firm or a crypto firm, banks are moving very slowly um, in terms of innovating. What they don't have is the technology to back them. And that's where the crypto and the payments firms really differ because they can innovate at rapid speed. And that's why the regulators are constantly trying to catch up. And when finally the regulators catch up with these firms, these firms have already innovated even further. So it's almost like a catch up game constantly. But I wouldn't say that payment institutions are helping banks. They're the alternative to banks. Right. OK, now moving back to 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 blockchain monitoring, that's very interesting. So uh, obviously there are different uh, providers that, that do do this. Um, as far as I understand this uh, type of solutions, they basically what they score the, the blockchain, they they determine whether the specific address or constellation of addresses belongs to, let's say, Darknet or um, ransomware or whatever, uh, any any type of uh, risk, high risk. Um, entities right and uh, so this is kind of like an, an evolving process so there are, some, there are of course many addresses that they don't know and there are many addresses that can change I guess its reputation to a certain extent and obviously the problem also is that when you when you score the transaction um, this transaction uh, may have visited many different addresses uh, throughout its, its its way, and so for example, okay, there will be let's say one one um, uh, percent of uh, of of uh, let's say ransomware or or darknet, and to which extent this will change the risk status of the whole transaction. Question number two probably would be uh, if you have let's say thousands of transactions, is it possible to automate the analysis of this um, this blockchain? of this blockchain analysis procedures because obviously you, you need someone to to score uh, to 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 realize to to an analyze the um, the level of risk that is posed by this or that transaction yeah so going back to your first point it's a really important point actually because once a wallet has transacted with let's say another address which is illicit or higher risk that wallet is now tainted that's how i like to see it Right, so this transaction could have happened three, four years ago, and it might have been a cluster of transactions that came into it. But due to this, that wallet is now seen as high risk. So I know there are many exchanges out there that have wallets that are deemed high risk because they receive hundreds of thousands of transactions a day, right? And you can't stop the transactions coming through. It's just the nature of the blockchain. Um, and because of that, it becomes tainted. But what you can do is going back to your risk-based approach, which I mentioned earlier, and it kind of answers your second question as well, but I'll focus on the first one as uh, a bit more, is a lot of these solutions are saying now, because um, there's so many solutions in the marketplace, but as you said, you know, it might say 5%'s been on the dark net, 10%'s been uh, on ransomware. The compliance officer on the other side has to determine is that within our risk appetite? How long ago did these transactions take place that were based on a weak AML exchange or they were seen on the dark net or a Ponzi scheme and so on? I mean, I wouldn't advise to transact with a Ponzi scheme address anyway, but that's just an example. But going back to your second question of almost how are you reviewing them, right? What these um, blockchain monitoring solutions are now doing, uh, one that I work with very closely, is they introduce your ability to score wallets in the way you want to. So if, for example, I want to put a parameter within our systems that says, actually, the dark net is perfectly fine for us. I don't mind accepting transactions from here. I don't want it to be assigned to any case officer. Just let them all through. I'll put a risk rating on there, a risk scoring model on there. Whereas before, the actual blockchain solution provider used to score it predominantly themselves, but they're now tailoring it because they understand that there's a different risk appetite from one firm to another. And if, for example, okay, you, you receive, receive funds from, from a tainted wallet and you consider it high risk, 
um, what would be your uh, recommendation what to do with the with the coins that you have received so my recommendation would be to review the history of that address right have a look where it's transacting because you can do clusters you can review on the blockchain uh, the solutions you can check where it's transacted throughout its whole history don't get me wrong you might get a massive spider web of transaction which you can't even read but you also need to see how many hops essentially has it taken to come to you um, prior to anything looking high risk so as an example a transaction could have gone from a Seychelles entity with weak AML controls and KYC then gone into another exchange let's say in Asia somewhere then they've gone through to let's say somewhere in England uh, one of the larger exchanges in crypto and you know full well they do full KYC full AML and then if it's come from them then to us although the wallet has been the address has been tainted you know it's already gone through other elements so it's been layered essentially before it's come to you that doesn't mean that you should accept it but what it means is it's come from another exchange that's very reputable and they've also done their checks so that should bring a little bit of um, protection to yourself however that's not the only recommendation i would make you want to see who's behind that address right who's behind those wallets um when you do that you need to find out the kyc of that client um, you want to know how much is being transacted because that's always a big risk in itself. Which cryptocurrency is being transacted on which blockchain, of course, because each one has its own. Um, and then if you need to, you would then freeze those assets and then you may have to report that as a SAR depending on what your investigation is showing. Are you, um, let's say, recommending to, to distinguish between different blockchains in terms of their risk? In risk status? Not so much the different blockchains, but for example, if you look at uh, the coin Monero, which has been popular for the last five, six years for being a privacy coin, that coin obviously is very high risk compared to any other coin because you don't know who the user is because of the privacy protocols on it. You also have so many coins now in the market. Um, these blockchain monitoring uh, solutions, they don't track every coin, they just track the main ones and there's loads of main ones now. But it can also be the fluctuation, right? So some coins can be more steady than the others. I mean, a lot of them, like Bitcoin, for example, has wild swings, as can Ethereum. And if you look at Solana recently, it's probably had such a large fall compared to others. Um, you want to look out for things like that. So. You want to look at trends so if bitcoin is let's say bitcoin is increasing in price what you're going to expect at your exchanges people may want to liquidate that so what you're going to expect is there's going to be lots of withdrawals coming through because people want to profit on it um it's better except the you know the old traditional uh hodlers as we say like myself who try never to sell anything um <laughs> me too yeah exactly but then on the flip side when the price of crypto is becoming less let's say cheaper um what you're going to expect is a lot of people to start buying but also a certain portion of the market that gets fear right it's the fear and greed index so they're going to start literally just uh, dropping their crypto just because they're worried that it's not going to go back up again um, another example of, uh, of, uh, of let's say um, making the transaction risk risk status cleaner to a certain extent um, uh, along with uh, layering would be also mixing and tumbling Tornado Cash is one of the largest mixers, and it's basically a, as itself, it's a smart contract, so you, like anyone, can use it, um, and it's considered um, um, by some sources as one of the few legal cryptocurrency mixing uh, protocols. Um, how do you? F feel about the things like mixers and tumblers in general um, uh, how do you see, like if for example you you see a, a, a track of mixing in the transaction that you are checking uh, how, do, how would, would you consider this this trace yeah so with um, so with mixers I mean they are high risk because as you mentioned you mentioned the keyword of layering light right it's eluding detection essentially because it's mixing up all the coins if you 
imagine coins going into a cup and you're shaking it and then you start distributing it. That's essentially what it is to hide the truth of the real ownership of it. However, mixers and tumblers, they're also used for legal purposes as well. Um, not so much legal, but the word I'm looking for is not illicit essentially. When you're doing a batch payment to let's say employees that you wanna pay out crypto for, you send it to a mixer and then the mixer then mixes it all up and sends it to all of your employees. So it eludes detection of how much is going to who and where, because the blockchain's all public. So I could literally, as an employee, go check up on my other employees if I know their wallet addresses and so on, and see, oh, how much of a bonus did they get compared to me? But once it goes to the mixer, if company A sends 100 Bitcoin to the mixer, and then the mixer now distributes that 100 coins evenly, 10 Bitcoins each to 10 individuals. And even if it's uneven, it's not a problem because those 10 employees can't see what the other employee has had. So that's a sort of a use case for mixers. I mean, they are seen as high risk because actually the nefarious purposes of it are a lot larger than the use case that I've illustrated here. But I always see it as a high risk. I wouldn't necessarily say if I saw the mixer flag, um, I would think reject or let's completely investigate this client. Um, there would have to be other factors that are involved as well. Again, we are encountering many uh, clients who, for example, um, let's say gathered some kind of a wealth, usually on like standalone wallets, out of being a early user in some kind of a project, uh, or let's say early referee, etc., etc. So they received some distribution um, of coins, and then they, let's say, uh, exchange those coins against Ethers on, uh, on Binance or elsewhere, um, and did it in the right moment, so they now have a fortune. Um, and obviously then they come to you, and as far as I heard, um, sometimes they have compliance issues with that because um, it's not that easy to um, determine, like, to confirm that you have uh, gained this this wealth uh, in the correct way because it's not a payslip and it's not like a <laughs> it's not a um, employment contract or anything like that in the inheritance paper. Um, so how would how would uh, what would uh, a compliance team, let's say, of your projects? Uh, look at in order to um, decline or accept um, such a user? Let's go back to source of wealth because source of wealth is paramount in um, any financial institution. You need to understand where your client's wealth is coming from. How have they accumulated it? There's a few reasons for that. One is you're looking for high risk indicators on your client such as are they a politically exposed person? Now, if they're a politically exposed person, that doesn't mean they're a decline. It means they're higher risk because they have a government public office job. And with that comes great responsibility, but also where are the funds coming from? Has this government minister, for example, is he using public funds to buy a Bitcoin? You know, we want to know where are your, where is your source of wealth? How are you buying? Um, how are you buying this artwork for $2 million? How are you purchasing this Bitcoin for 50,000 USD, right? We want to know that. And the way we find that sort of things out is we ask for bank statement, proof of employment. We look back at the history, right? Of where it's come from. And myself, I always like to use a layer of attestation and get the potential PEP or an actual PEP to sign off that they haven't used government funds. Now, you're right when you talk about the crypto element of source of wealth. I could essentially, and I've got a funny story about this actually, it's a true story, and it happened to me last November. I wanted to pay a chunk of my house mortgage off. So that was when crypto was really on the rise and I really didn't want to sell any, but I thought, oh, this looks too good to be true. So I liquidated some Bitcoin. I instructed a solicitor and I said to my solicitor, right, 
I want to pay off a chunk of my mortgage. Here's my money. Showed him my bank statement and he's like, but how did that money get in your bank statement? I said, I understand you're doing your AML checks. I'm also an AML officer and a consultant and an advisor. Here's my LinkedIn, here's my CV. I understand exactly what you're doing. All the funds are clean. And he's like, that's all fine, but where did the funds come from? Now, it's not that I was scared to tell him that I've liquidated crypto. I knew as soon as I tell him I've liquidated crypto, he's not gonna have a clue what I'm talking about. So I said to him, I've liquidated my crypto, here are my um, exchanges and you know the exchanges went back five six years so you know from Bitcoin to Ethereum Ethereum to Bitcoin Bitcoin to Litecoin and so on whenever there was a fluctuation so he's looking at all this and he's like Raj what is this I don't understand this looks all um, fake to me I was like it's not fake this is real um, so he's like I'm not sure I can take your case on so I said I can't remember his name now but I said let me come to your office so I went to his office because he's doing it all by email went to his office and this is where the blockchain monitoring solutions come in. So I logged in to my blockchain monitoring solution that's been provided to me and I put in my address and I showed him where all of my crypto had been and I said this is the source of wealth right. I had purchased crypto for £600 in 2015 and over the years they have fluctuated at x percent and this is why I now have this much money in my bank account because I liquidated it. He approved it, I paid off my chunk of mortgage, but the key bit was the blockchain monitoring solution showed where my funds were going through, right? But I think he just approved it because he was really confused about what I was talking about, what I was showing him on this massive chart. <laughs> but the point is, there's all different ways of checking a client's source of wealth by asking questions and by tracking, especially in the crypto world, on the blockchain uh, monitoring solutions. There is a recent uh, chain analysis report um, on crypto crime um, 2022. Um, and so in this report, there are also interesting figures. Uh, but the main thing, what is interesting is that in 2021, the amount of money that uh, have been uh, received by illicit addresses became $18 billion as opposed to $7 billion in 2020. So it uh, raised uh, twice uh, for a year. And probably the, the prospects will be quite the same in the coming year, in uh, 2022, uh, when they get some figures. So this shows uh, that uh, someone could say that, uh, crypt that money laundering in crypto is out of control. And, uh, and of course, I guess many people would say that for, for them, the, 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 the easiest idea how to launder money would be through crypto. crypto. Um, what would be your answer to these people? I'd say they're mistaken. Cash is still king when it comes to laundering crypto. Crypto is getting a bad name because it's the young kid on the block, right? Um, if I transfer my 10 pounds to you, Tony, and then you transfer that 10 pounds to somebody else, there's no way of detecting where that money is moving. Put that on a larger scale of the cartels, for example. Um, you can't track the physical pound in that way. On the blockchain, at least you can still track all the crypto. You know where it's going, where it's coming from, and you're hoping one firm will see these red flags and they'll freeze the funds um, and they'll report them to the appropriate authorities. It's the popularity of crypto. The adoption is getting more. So where the adoption gets more, if it's been tainted as illicit, doesn't necessarily mean it was money laundering they were doing. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it could be illicit because it was seen on the dark web. I think all it is is there's a greater focus on crypto because it's new and it's not fully understood by everyone, especially the regulators, um, and they're quite fearful of it. Um, but the adoption of regulation is, some of it's already here, but it will definitely be all here within the next two to three years uh, because, I mean, Europe is going to become harmonised, so it's not going to be you know, certain firms are like, Estonia's getting strict, let's go to Lithuania. You know, that's not going to happen in three years' time. Uh, in three years' time, it's, gonna, it's not going to matter where you go. The crypto firms that have opened up in, for example, Germany or France, 
they've already seen where the market is going. So they're like, actually, let's go to the strictest jurisdiction with the strictest regular. Let's get things right now. Because these firms that are going to, and this is with no disrespect to Lithuania, because I know Lithuania is actually tightening their regulations in um, November themselves. But right now it's just a crypto registration. It's not a authorization or licensing. It's just a registration that you need over there. In November, that's all going to change. You know, you're going to have to essentially reapply for your license. So any companies moving there right now and aren't doing appropriate KYC and transaction monitoring, in six, seven months, they're going to have to do it. Um, and a lot of companies will think this. Let's just move our operations from, and I'm going to use Estonia because Estonia's new regulations are kicking in from June 15th. They'll be like, where do we move to now? You can't just keep jumping from country to country. Um, it doesn't work like that. Get settled now. And when the regulation really hits you, you will be ready. You probably heard that, uh, I mean, I'm sure you just know that uh, Dubai uh, and Malta just got on the gray list. Uh, we see some other changes uh, flowing out of this uh, uh, war in Ukraine uh, for, for Russia, for Belarus. I think for Ukraine, this will also make a lot, a lot of change in reality. Um, at the same time, we see that, for example, Europe does not include uh, Turkey uh, on, a, on, its, on its high risk list, even though it's on the gray list for FATF uh, purposes. So um, obviously there is some political element there, but still, uh, how would you consider the importance of the geographical risk in the way how, how we can approach it with all this gray lists of FATF and uh, some high risk lists of the European Union? Maybe you have some, some hints of some ideas about that. Yeah, geographic risk is huge. I mean, as this war has shown us, um, you know, the the funds coming in and out of Russia, for example, and then with Belarus supporting Russia as well. Um, it had everybody scratching their heads uh, back in towards the end of February, beginning of March of what do we do here with these countries, right? Um, some businesses, maybe 75% of their business comes from Russia. Um, I know a lot of the crypto firms, their transactions were coming out of Russia. But when I look at geographical risk, you mentioned UAE essentially in Malta, right? You look at someone like Cyprus, in fact, you know, high risk gaming, uh, you know, I won't go too much into it without defaming anyone. I don't want to get sued by anyone in any state, but Cyprus is high risk in general as well. And that's why a lot of the high risk gaming companies, you know, they left Turkey and they went to Cyprus. And I hear uh, from the Turkish waters, you can actually see Cyprus and that's where all the gaming companies have gone. Although Cyprus is considered medium risk, in, usually at least. Yeah, but it is actually high risk. It, I consider it as a high risk jurisdiction because you have to look at the market segment, which financial institutions are making up most of it outside of banks, right? So is it gaming, casinos, online casinos? Is it online gaming? Now Malta, the reason Malta, I believe, got grey listed is because everyone ran to Malta to get their EMIs and their um, licenses. And they opened the country up to everyone. And when you do that, you're gonna get some that will comply really well, but a lot of them won't. And that's what's happened. And I believe this is what has also happened in Estonia. Because Estonia have also been going through a money vault audit because they let crypto firms in 2017, 18, and everyone went in there. Then Estonia de-risked many, many crypto exchanges in 2020, and you had to go for a relicensing authorization. And now once again, from June 15th, although it was implemented on March the 15th, you have to comply with regulations that are on semi-par with an EMI. And I assume they are gonna de-risk lots and lots of crypto companies again. And Moneyville will review the economy in general, the controls that all these financial institutions have. And my feeling is that maybe even Estonia could go into the gray list um, because they don't have sufficient controls in place. UAE, again, I mean, you look at all the crypto companies going into the UAE now as well. Uh, the money laundering controls, right, it's not just based on the institution, it's based on the governments as well. So where a government may be a little bit more corrupt and maybe a little bit more lenient, um, have less oversight. Look at Pakistan, you know, 
Pakistan has been on the grey list as well. All the time. Uh, there's a lot of corruption that was going from that country as well, and that's why they put it on the grey list, although they have made um, significant improvements. Turkey, uh, you know, the geographical risk is huge for me when I look at my client's profile. Um, it gets a little bit more confusing when you're doing a business because you have to look at different things when it's a business. You'll have a country of incorporation, but really what really matters is not the registered address, but where are the operations of the firm taking place? Where are the employees of that firm? And outside of the employees of the firm, which clients are they servicing? Which countries are those? And so you, for that, for a company, you're looking at like three or four different segments for the geographical risk. Um, being on the gray list isn't the end of the world. Um, I think, you know, it makes partnerships a little bit more difficult because they see you as less trusted because of the country you're in. But if you can show adequate controls, frameworks, procedures in place that you're doing appropriate KYC transaction monitoring and you're trying to be above board, then I feel like you shouldn't taint every um, company within that country uh, with the same brush, basically. You shouldn't paint them all with the same brush. I have a traditional last question uh, that I'm asking every guest, which is, uh, what would you do? What would be your first decision if you become the uh, head of the uh, financial regulator in the country? Uh, so if, for example, you would by a chance become a financial, uh, head of financial regulator in the, in the UK, what would be your first decision? My first decision would be to put an appropriate regulatory framework in place for crypto and not do something like the FCA did, which was a temporary registration, right? Put a framework in place, but I don't know what your other guests may have said, but what I would do is invest in the regulatory people. So for example, in the FCA, I would invest in bringing people in to the FCA with expertise, maybe from the private sector, maybe even contract them in. People that understand the crypto division, understand stable coins, understand the blockchain, understand smart contracts, bring them in because they need the expertise and build out a whole department, which I know the FCA are doing. But if you look at the temporary um, money laundering regulations regime that they had, right? The reason they kept extending the date on that is because they didn't have the manpower as in the staff to review these applications. So the FCA needs to be staffed appropriately or any regulator needs to be staffed appropriately and they need to understand it. The first thing that I would do if I went into a regulator, I would make sure there's an education across the whole group because yes, there were banks and there are banks. Yes, there were cards and there are cards and you have IBANs to go with them. You have wallets now, right? Wallets are very different from having a bank account. It's not a ledger, it's a wallet where you can transact through. But now crypto's here and I feel like People need educating on the use cases of crypto, when a crypto may be a utility payment token, when it may be a security, and just build out a framework with clarity. So any firm coming into your regulatory field, they understand actually, you know what, we're gonna to go to a regulator and we feel confident that we're presenting a company here and they'll understand that this is a utility token. Rather than having a flow chart that says, if it's this, if it's this, if it's this, it may be a security, it may be a utility. We need firm decisions by the regulator. Brilliantly said, brilliantly said. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, this was Rajpal Kangura. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, been a pleasure.